Tao here from National University of Singapore. Today I'm here to talk about this paper called Multi-Homing and Oligopolistic Platform Competition. This is a joint work with Chun Chun Liu, Julian Wright, and Jun Jie Zhou. And conveniently, all four, of us, all four of us are from the same institution. Let's get started with the introduction. These days, many platforms create economic value by facilitating transactions or interaction between buyers and service providers or sellers. These platforms compete intensely with each other. For example, we have ride-hailing platforms such as Uber and Lyft. We have meal grocery delivery platforms such as DoorDash, GrabHub, Postmate, and Uber Eats. We also have other examples in payment card platforms, hotel booking platforms, and e-commerce marketplaces. By now, there's a large literature on competition between two-sided platforms. However, if we look at the examples here, they have some important features that are not well studied in the existing literature. First, the fee charged by the platforms on each side are transaction-based. Second, sellers are free to mount it multi-home, that is, joining multiple platforms. For example, ride-hailing drivers, they can uh, freely drive for multiple platforms simultaneously. Third, when we talk about multi-homing, a large part of the literature focus on the so-called competitive bottleneck setup, whereby sellers are multi-homing and buyers are single-homing. However, in our examples here, buyers are usually free to multi-home and they decide which platform to complete transactions on. For example, when, I'm, when my wife and I uh, call for a ride and try to travel, what usually happen is I will switch on one ride-hailing ad and she will switch on another ride-hailing ad. We compare across the fees and the estimated time of arrival and choose which one to use. More generally, our motivation is that it is increasingly easy for buyers to multi-home. For example, there are meta search aggregators such as Google Maps and RideGuru, which allows riders to compare across multiple ride hailing apps without having multiple phones. Similar aggregators are also available for buyers to compare across multiple hotel booking platforms and food delivery platforms. Today, I will present a model that is tailored to have these key features. Specifically, in our model, there are oligopoly platforms competing in per-transaction fees. Platforms are differentiated from the buyer's perspective, but homogeneous from seller's perspective. This captures the fact that in many two-sided market applications, sellers view platforms as more or less the same, while buyers usually have idiosyncratic preference for using particular platforms. And finally, both sides are free to multi-home. Based on this model, we have three main results. First, we characterize the equilibrium of platform competition with two-sided multi-homing. We show that some existing insights from the membership fee models, such as the connection between homing behavior and equilibrium outcome, do not always apply. And the key reason here is that in this transaction environment, it is important to take into account transaction behaviors of buyers, which is a feature that's absent in these membership fee models. Second, we look at how increased platform competition affects total fee and fee structure. Fee structure here means how the total fee is allocated across the buyer side and the seller side. Here we find that increased competition lowers the total fee and shifts the fee structure in favor of sellers. Later, I will explain two distinct forces that drive the result drive this result. We will see how increasing the number of competing platforms affects the competition for buyers and the competition for sellers. And then we combine these two forces to get the overall effect. Finally, we consider increased multi-homing costs of buyers. Relative to our baseline here with uh, where all buyers can freely multi-home, we show that such multi-homing costs is going to raise total fee and shift the fee structure in favor of buyers. More importantly, such multi-homing costs is going to reverse the effect of increased platform competition on fee structure, which is discussed in this point too. Let me jump straight to the model. There's a set end of platforms, a continuum of buyers and sellers. 
Each platform charge per transaction fee on buyers and sellers. Buyers and sellers are free to multi-hope and participation is costless. Buyer and sellers wish to transact with each other to create economic value. Without loss of generality, we assume that every buyer-seller pair correspond to one potential transaction. So for example, the blue buyer here potentially wants to transact with every seller here. So there are three potential transactions here. Likewise, the green buyer potentially wants to transact with every seller here. There's no competition between sellers. Transaction can occur only if there is at least one platform that the pair of buyer and seller joins. To illustrate this point, let us focus on the first pair of buyer and seller here. Suppose there are four platforms. And suppose that the buyer joins platform one, two, four, the sellers join platform one, two, three. Then the transaction between this pair of buyer and seller can only occur through platform one or platform two. two. And it's also possible to have no transaction between this pair of uh, buyer and sellers. Consistent with our motivating examples such as right holding platforms, we assume that the buyer chooses whether to transact and if so, through which platform. Now suppose that the buyer has decided to transact through some platform I, so platform one here. The seller is going to get per transaction net utility, which is V minus by the seller fee charged by this platform I. Here, V is a gross value that is seller specific. It is invariant across platforms and IID across all the sellers. And it is distributed according to some CDFG. You can think of V as indexing the type of the sellers. Buyer per transaction net utility is given by the expression here. B0 here is the draw that is specific to the buyer and specific to the transaction. It is invariant across platform and IID across buyer and across transactions. It follows some distribution function, F0. Epsilon here is a buyer platform specific match component and it captures a buyer idiosyncratic preference for platforms. It is IID across buyer and platforms and follow some distribution function F. If there's no transaction between this pair of buyer and sellers, both of them are going to get zero utility. And we impose the standard log concavity assumption on the distribution functions. Platform profit is the sum of total transaction fee minus a marginal cost times the total volume of transaction. And I will explain this later. Our solution concept is SPNE with symmetric fees, whereby all the platforms set the same buyer fee and seller fee. And here's the timing to wrap up the model setup. First, all N platforms simultaneously set their buyer fee and seller fee. Then sellers and buyers observe all fees. Sellers observe their realized draw value and buyers observe their idiosyncratic preference for platforms. Then they simultaneously decide which platforms to join. After the participation, for each potential transaction, buyers observe their realized transaction-specific utility component, and they choose whether to transact, and if so, through which platform. In some scenarios, it is possible that buyers observe their preference for the platform only at the point of transaction. Also, sometimes buyers may not observe seller fee, and this reflects their vertical arrangement between platform and sellers could be confidential. Going with these alternative assumptions won't affect our analysis. So let's go into the analysis. Let us analyze user decision after platforms have set the fees. Buyer makes two decisions. First, participation decision is straightforward. Notice that it is a weekly dominant strategy to join all platform. This is due to zero joining costs and the fact that buyers can choose the final transaction median. This means that buyers get access to more transactions options by joining more platform. And so in the equilibrium, all buyers are going to join the set of all platforms. Next, consider buyer choice of transaction median. 
To do so, let's suppose that there's a seller V that joins a set theta of platforms. Then the mass of buyers that transact with this seller through platform I is given by the expression here. This is the mass of buyers who prefer transacting through platform I over other platforms in set theta and who prefer transactions over no transaction. This object is the standard discrete choice random utility maximization and it depends only on buyer distributions F and F0. We now consider sellers. They make only participation decision. It is fairly easy to show that on the equilibrium path where all platforms set the same fee, all sellers with value above the equilibrium fee is going to multi-home on all platforms. And all sellers with value below this fee will join nothing. To pin down the equilibrium fees, let us consider off equilibrium path in which a platform I deviates by increasing its seller fee. Let's let that be platform one and suppose that there are only three platforms. Given that all platforms except one set the lowest seller fee P hat, it is easy to see that sellers either join nothing, join all platforms except one, and join all platforms, including platform one. Notice that what really matters to the deviating platform one is the cutoff here, which is the seller indifferent between joining all platforms and quitting platform one only. So let us try to pin down this cutoff. Consider a seller V that is joining all platforms. The number of transactions that comes through platform one is B1 here. For each such transaction, the seller gets V minus platform one's seller fee. And likewise for transaction that comes through platform two and platform three, uh, which is B2 and B3 here, the seller gets V minus the symmetric seller fee that this platform charge. Now suppose that the seller wants to quit platform one in response to its higher fee. What will happen? Consider the buyers who have been using platform one to transact with this seller. When platform one is unavailable, some of the buyer will simply switch to use other platform to continue transacting with this seller V. And so the seller is going to gain from diverting this bias away from the expensive platform one to other cheaper platforms to entry. And so this allows the seller to save on the fee difference here. At the same time, however, some buyers who really like platform one and dislike other platforms will simply stop transacting. So they will switch to no transaction here as indicated in the green arrow. The seller is going to incur a loss from losing access to these buyers. In some, when trying to decide uh, whether to quit platform one, the seller trades off between the gain from diverting buyers to cheaper platform with the loss of foregone transactions. Notice from here that it will be less profitable to quit platform one if this sigma, which is the fraction of buyers who stop transacting, is large. In the paper, we call this sigma buyer loyalty to platform. The idea is that if buyers are highly loyal to platform one, then it is hard for each seller to divert their transaction, even though buyers are multi me. From here, if we solve the indifference condition, sellers with value below the cutoff indicated here will quit platform one. And notice that the cutoff depends on buyer loyalty here. Now we want to determine the volume of transactions. We know that when platform one sets the highest fee compared to the other platforms, only sellers with value above this cutoff will join platform one together with other platforms. So the set here, one, two, three, these sellers are joining all the platforms. Each of the sellers over here will generate B1 transactions for the platform. And so the volume of transaction uh, on platform one is simply the mass of participating sellers times the transaction brought in by uh, each of these sellers. When the platform wants increase its fee further, it trades off between a higher fee versus fewer participating sellers as indicated here. Notice that 
the elasticity of seller participation is high if buyer loyalty is low. So far, we only consider the case of uh, outward deviation by platform one. The case of uh, downward deviation, downward deviation is fairly similar. So let me briefly describe it. When platform one deviates by undercutting its seller fee, the logic of, of seller participation is similar. Each seller trade off between creating the more expensive platform to divert buyers to the cheapest platform one versus losing access to some buyers. However, the exact participation profile is more complicated. Off equilibrium path, sellers may sing join nothing, single home on platform one, join all platforms or anything in between. Notice here that sellers that multi-home on fewer platforms is going to bring in more transaction for platform one. And the reason is that buyers who want to transact with these sellers over here is more likely to use uh, platform one for transaction. In fact, in this case, they can only use platform one to transact. Over here, they can use platform one or two. And over here, it is either one, two, or three. When platform one lowers its fee further, the range of single homing uh, sellers become larger. And that is going to bring in more transactions for platform one. And so in this case, the platform trades off between lower fee and less multi-homing by sellers. And so essentially there's a trade-off between the fee and the transaction volume. And you can see that the trade-off is quite parallel across the two cases. To state the equilibrium, we define buyer inverse semi-elasticity as S, as X over here. So it is just the equilibrium demand on uh, platform I divided by this uh, demand derivative. Intuitively, this X captures the standard competitive markup with N competing firms, and it is uh, followed from the standard Pelosolo type of model. Likewise, we define buyer loyalty index sigma here as the fraction of buyers who stop transacting when one of the platform I uh, is unavailable for transaction. Intuitively, this sigma, which is between zero and one, captures how difficult it is for sellers to divert buyer transactions across platform. Given these two uh, definitions, we can state the proposed equilibrium as follows. In the equilibrium, all platforms set buyer fee and seller fee. That is the unique solution to the condition here. This is saying that the platform total margin equals to X defined earlier, which represents platform market power over buyers, which equals to this is like a mono, standard monopoly markup discounted by buyer loyalty index defined above here. Notice that it is smaller than one. This composite term represents platform market power over sellers. If you try to interpret this equilibrium, then uh, we can rewrite it as follows. The equilibrium buyer fee is the sum of platform marginal cost plus platform market power over buyers minus a cross subsidy term that is due to the extra revenue uh, from the seller fee. Likewise, the same decomposition applies for the equilibrium seller fee. From this equations, I want to make three observations. First, the source of cross subsidization here is different from the membership pricing models like Anshong and Tan and Joe. In those models, the platform wants to subsidize, for example, sellers because extra seller participation increased buyer willingness to pay for platform membership. However, that kind of dynamic is absent in our setup because transaction fees are like an insulating tariff to use uh, Glenville's terminology. Instead, in our setup, the cross subsidization here reflects what we call usage externality. Additional participation by sellers is going to increase the transaction by all existing buyers on the platform. And that is going to generate extra buyer fees that offset platform costs. Second observations, recall that in our model, uh, both sides are free to multi-home. Yet this does not necessarily imply a specific market outcome because we have to take into account this uh, sigma. 
In particular, when Sigma buyer loyalty index is very high, then buyers are highly loyal. And it is almost impossible for sellers to divert their transactions. In this case, if Sigma equals to one, you can see that platforms have monopoly power over the sellers. And this results in classic competitive uh, bottleneck outcome, as if buyers are single home meet, but recall that they are actually multi home meet. So transaction behavior drives the result here. To the other extreme, when loyalty index is small, buyers are, uh, has high willingness to switch to other platforms. And in this case, uh, platforms have very big market power over the sellers because it's quite easy for sellers to divert their transactions. Third, recall that in our model, sellers view platforms as homogeneous. And based on this, standard intuition would suggest that platforms should, uh, firms should have zero market power, at least over this side. However, in our transaction platform setting, seller difficulty in diverting buyers create platform market power over sellers. In other words, elasticity of seller participation in this kind of setting has to be derived from buyer transaction behavior. We next look at the implication of uh, increased platform competition. Let me state the result first. An increase in the, plat in the number of platforms N is going to decrease total fee, decrease seller fee if buyer distribution has weakly decreasing density, and increase buyer fee if both buyer and seller distribution have uh, weakly, weakly decreasing densities. This result is suggesting that increased competition in this two-sided multi-homing setup is going to shift fee structure in favor of sellers, decrease seller fee and increase buyer fee, right? So the question is, why is it that competition favors sellers? What's the mechanism behind the result? To discuss the intuition, let us first reinterpret the equilibrium condition graphically. The buyer fee equation can be interpreted as a blue curve here. For each given seller fee, the blue curve tells us the equilibrium condition for the buyer fee. Likewise, the green equation here, the seller fee equation, can be interpreted as the green curve here. For each given buyer fee, the green curve tells us the equilibrium condition for the seller fee. So the overall equilibrium is simply the intersection between these two curves. That is the intersection of the equilibrium conditions for both sides of the market. Now, increased competition. So let us focus on the buyer side first. From the blue equation, increased competition makes buyer quasi demand more elastic. And that is going to intensify uh, competition for buyers. So X decreases. Graphically, the blue curve shifts downwards, and that is going to exert a downward pressure on buyer fee. At the same time, however, from the green equation, we notice that the lower buyer fee means that it becomes less profitable for platform to attract sellers. And that is going to exert an outward pressure on uh, seller fee. This is the so-called seesaw effect in the literature. And graphically, it is just a movement along this green curve seesaw effect. Finally, our log concavity assumption implies an incomplete pass-through property. And so the increase in seller fee is always smaller than the decrease in the buyer fee. And consequently, the total fee is going to decrease. Next, let us focus on the seller side of the market. From the green equation, the low uh, increased competition is going to make the platforms more substitutable. And so that affects buyer loyalty index and makes buyers less loyal. When buyers are less loyal, then it becomes easier for sellers to divert their transaction through seller participation. And so that is going to intensify the competition for sellers. Graphically, the green curve here shifts inward, and that is going to exert a downward pressure on the seller fee. And again, we have the seesaw effect because from the blue equation here, um, the lower seller fee implies that it becomes less profitable to attract buyers. And so we have the seesaw effect over here where we have a movement along this curve, along the blue curve. 
Again, we have this incomplete pass-through property. So the increase in buyer fee is going to be smaller than the decrease in seller fee. So the total fee again decreases. Combining both pictures, we know that platform competition intensify the competition for both buyers and sellers. And both effects uh, are going to decrease the total fee, but the change in fee structure is ambiguous. Notice that the two effects shift the fee structure in opposite directions. To proceed further, we intuitively, intuitively we can think of the effect of competition on the fee on each side as decrease in the market power over the site, adjusted by the net seesaw effect discussed earlier. This net seesaw effect is going to be positive if and only if the decrease in buyer loyalty index, which represent uh, platform market power over sellers, is greater than the decrease in buyer inverse elasticity, which represent platform market power over buyers. The mathematical condition is listed here. This condition depends only on buyer preference distribution F and F0. And it turns out that it holds quite generally. For example, uh, if F has weekly decreasing density or if F and F0 are gumbo, so that we have a logic demand uh, formulation. When the, uh, when the condition stated in the proposition holds, then this net seesaw effect is going to be positive. And from the equation here, uh, net seesaw effect aligns with the decrease in market power over sellers, and so seller fee decrease unambiguously. If we impose stronger assumption, then this net seesaw effect is going to be positive and large, and it is, is going to dominate the decrease in market power over buyers. And in this case, buyer fee is going to increase unambiguously. So from here, you can see that this condition uh, plays an important role. So why should we expect it to hold? What is the intuition? Intuitively, having more platforms is going to affect buyer behavior in two ways. First, platforms become more substitutable, and that's going to decrease the inverse elasticity and decrease buyer loyalty. So this is fairly standard. However, recall that our model has incomplete market coverage. And so that is going to trigger a market expansion effect that increase the inverse elasticity. But more importantly, it is going to decrease buyer loyalty index. And this is because when there are more platforms, buyer outside option of not transacting is relatively less attractive now. So that buyers are less likely to transact whenever seller quits a platform. Notice that the two effects on sigmas are aligned, whereas the two effects on X are offsetting each other. And so this explains the condition here. From the analysis, we notice that there's this novel object called buyer loyalty index. In the paper, we try to unpack this and we ask what are the factors that influence it. We look at multi-homing cost of buyers, value of transacting for buyers, buyer heterogeneity, and seller side factors. We also explore how do these factors interact with the effect of increased platform competition. For the sake of time, I will just focus on multi-homing cost of uh, buyers. Consider the following extension. Suppose that buyers obtain a standalone uh, participation benefit, which can be zero from joining the first platform. Then they incur a multi-homing cost, which uh, or a benefit if this cost is negative for each additional platform join. Buyers have heterogeneous multi-homing costs distributed according to some CDF. For simplicity, we will assume that all buyers observe only buyer's fees and not seller fees. This is going to simplify the analysis of buyer participation decision, but does not affect the main insight we want to deliver here. This setup will give rise, give rise to an equilibrium with partial multi-homing by buyers. Buyers with negative multi-homing costs will multi-home on all platforms, and buyers with positive multi-homing costs will single home. So let us denote the mass of multi-homing buyers here as lambda. The equilibrium fee will take the form that is similar as before. Notice that the market power over buyers is unaffected by the multi-homing costs. The idea is that there's always some form of competition for buyers regardless of their homing behavior. For buyers who are multi-homing, then platforms compete for their usage. 
for buyers who are single homing, platforms compete for their participation. And so market power over buyers remain the same as before. However, as for the market power over sellers, notice that we have a redefined loyalty index. When lambda increases so that more buyers are multi-homing, the loyalty index decreases. So this means that sellers find it easier to divert buyers and that's going to weaken platform market power over sellers. So a higher lambda generate a downward pressure on seller feed and through the seesaw effect, that is going to create an outward pressure on the buyer feed. Formerly, we have the following result stating that more multi-homing by buyers decrease the total fee and shift the fee structure in favor of sellers. Let's try to compare this result with the classic competitive bottleneck type of result. In those settings, uh, for example, Armstrong and Armstrong and Wright and Belafin and Tights, buyers are single homing. And so platforms have monopoly powers over the multi-homing sellers. This is similar to our setup in the special case of Lambda equals to zero, except that uh, we are delivering this result in a transaction fee setting. Whereas those paper de deliver it in a membership fee setting. And more importantly, proposition three here is saying that more multi-homing by buyers is going to mitigate the monopoly power here over the multi-homing sellers. In other words, multi-homing by buyers open up the competitive bottleneck and restores the platform competition for sellers. Next, we look at the interaction. We find that homing behavior of buyers can actually reverse the effect of competition. Specifically, we show that an increase in the number of platforms, uh, regardless of Lambda, is always decrease is always going to decrease the total fee. However, if the mass of multi-homing buyers is sufficiently large, we get something like a baseline model where the fee structure uh, shift in favor of sellers. However, when most of the buyers are single homing, we will get a reverse result whereby the fee structure shift in favor of buyers now. What's the intuition? When most of the buyers are single homing, then platforms basically have monopoly power over sellers, and that's going to insulate them from competitive pressure. And so increasing the number of platforms is not going to affect the competition for sellers, but it intensifies the competition of, uh, for buyers. And so in overall, competition will shift fee structure in favor of buyers in this case, when Lambda is more. Most of the uh, buyers are single home meet. In the paper, we also look at uh, other key competitive statics. So we look at uh, increased buyer heterogeneity and to, to do so, we introduce a scale parameter for non-deterministic component in buyer utility. We also look at uh, increased value of transaction for buyers where we introduce an additive shifter to buyer utility from transacting. We also consider seller side factors, for example, increased value of transaction for sellers and the introduction of competition between sellers. So recall that in the baseline, uh, sellers do not compete with each other. In all this exercise, we show that uh, buyer loyalty index sigma plays an important role in understanding these uh, comparative statics. So here's the summary of our result. Today, I present a model of oligopolistic platform competition where the platform competes in uh, transaction fees and there's two-sided multi-homing. We show that increasing extent of buyer multi-homing is going to decrease the total fee and shift the fee structure in favor of sellers. We also show that number of platforms when it increase is going to decrease the total fee, but its effect on fee structure uh, can be different uh, depending on the homing behavior of buyers. We also look at buyer heterogeneity and show that more heterogeneity increase total fee and shift the fee structure in favor of sellers. And we also look at value of transactions for buyers and sellers, showing that those increase uh, the total fee and shift uh, fee structure in favor of sellers and buyers respectively. So what are the key takeaways from today's exercise? First, we show that the effect of competition 
with two-sided multi-homing work very differently compared to a uh, competition with a competitive bottleneck. In particular, notice here that the effect of platform competition on the fee structure can be reversed depending on the homing behavior. The second highlight is that we show that transaction-based model works quite differently with membership model, which is widely adopted in the literature. In environment where the transaction decisions or bias is important, we have to take into account transaction behavior. And we show that this buyer loyalty index provides a good measure to summarize such uh, transaction behavior. And I think I have a bit of time, so let me conclude with the re relation to the literature. So our model has the following key features. And we know that uh, by now there's a large literature in two-sided market based on the works of this uh, Semitum papers. Our paper is the most closely related to the three papers listed here. Tan and Joe consider the effect of oligopolistic competition. We show that uh, the homing behavior can potentially reverse the effect of oligopolistic platform competition on the fee structure. So homing de behavior is important. Second, uh, Bellaflin and Pikes uh, analyze competitive bottleneck and the implication of that. We show how their insights extend to a transaction fee setting after taking into account that uh, buyer loyalty index plays an important role in our environment. And finally, Burkos and Halabuta consider two-sided multi-homing and they show that in such setting, uh, cross-subsidization is absent when you have a membership pricing model. We show that their insight does not extend to our transaction fee environment because our model has uh, incomplete market coverage. And finally, notice that these three papers consider membership pricing, whereas we consider per transaction fees. Finally, uh, our investigation into multi-homing behavior is related to those in the work on advertisement platforms and media markets. However, the exact mechanism and setting is very different from ours because of this mechanism of sellers diverting the buyers. And so uh, the insights are not uh, quite applicable to one another. And that will be the all of my presentation. Thank you, Ted Hill. Uh, and thanks for being on time, by the way. Um, Marcus, do you wanna do a discussion? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, so I, I guess my task is mainly to um, um, ask some questions and stimulate the discussion so without giving a summary of the paper. So nevertheless, let me briefly start by saying that um, I think it's a very nice paper. And in particular, the model is very elegantly set up, very general, um, in particular with this difficult question on who multi-homes, what drives multi-homing. And I think the authors did a very good job in, in kind of ex setting up a, a tractable model, which gives some interesting insights. So in particular, I like the two features that also Tatao was, um, uh, was emphasizing, namely that there is one side here, the consumers, which make a choice on which platforms to transact, I guess, which very naturally reflects um, what's going on in most um, um, platform markets. And also they nicely condense this into um, this consumer loyalty index, I guess, which is a new feature, um, how to analyze platform markets and how kind of different um, um, kind of environments in the market, like the number of firms, sellers, and so on, affect um, um, the behavior of consumers and what we can discern from this um, for fees and also for potentially the welfare um, of this market. Now, saying this, so let me um, um, give some comments or more thoughts um, that crossed my mind um, and when reading the paper and also when I'm listening um, to, to the discussion. So the first is, um, and this was also emphasized by Tatao in the very last slide, um, or, or not the very last, but the next to last slide on the related literature, that a lot is out there on membership fees. And so this paper focuses purely on, on per transaction fees. So a natural question, and I guess also kind of um, 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 stimulated by the fact that when looking at what are the fees that usually most platforms are charging, for example, Amazon or also many others. So it's often a combination of the two. And also in addition, there might be revenue share. So it's not only a, a per transaction fee. So I'm paying the, um, the or I need to pay as a seller the platform for each transaction taken out by the consumer. But the value of the transaction is also taken into account. 
Um, so kind of Amazon charges whatever 20 or 10 percent, depending on how large the um, overall volume is um, and for, for each transaction. And so one question is, um, 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 how would the results um, generalize or is there any idea um, whether the results would remain if one takes this, let's say, two part tariffs between membership and per transaction fees or also revenue shares? Let aside the other two into account. So, is there a similarity between um, um, these things, or does it mainly hold for per, per transaction fees? A second thought, which probably I'm not alone, um, I'm, I'm having this thought when listening to the presentation, um, is well, in a lot of these markets, it's about sellers offering particular products. Yes, these products are of course different for different sellers, but there is very likely some form of competition between sellers in there. And it's clear, so Tatao um, and didn't focus on this in the presentation, I think mainly because in the interest of time, in the paper, there are some um, thoughts on this, but I guess the natural question is, um, um, what would happen if there is competition between sellers, in particular, given the examples um, that were given uh, by, by you um, and also in the paper at the beginning of the talk um, or the beginning of the, of the paper, um, which one naturally thinks, well, riders for ride hailing services and sellers on um, trading platforms, that there should be at least some form of competition between them. Um, another point, um, and before coming to two points, which I think are more ex extensions, are, so when I guess when you were technically explaining um, how does multi-homing work, what you have in the end is a symmetric equilibrium in which um, in case there are no costs for the um, buyers to, to multi-home, all buyers multi-home and all buyers single home. But uh, sorry, all buyers multi-home as well, I'm sorry. But uh, the way kind of it works is what would happen if one platform increases or decreases one of the fees. And so suppose if one platform increases one of the fees, what you have shown is, well, then the, the behavior of the, the buyers in terms of multi-homing stays the same, but some sellers do no longer multi-home. And so it seems sort of the, the paper is a bit of a flavor of without any costs of the buyers to multi-home, all buyers multi-home. But if anyone does not multi-home, it's very likely the sellers because um, they kind of shift away from the more expensive platform and kind of steer the buyers to transact with them um, on the cheaper platform. And so my impression in markets was a bit the opposite, so that usually it's very easy for the sellers to multi-home and they do this, whereas for the buyers, probably they have their preferred um, um, trading platform and they are not only kind of, they multi-home and only trade there, but they are only active um, on, on, on this platform. And so my question is a bit how do these two things square with each other? So is this an inherent feature um, in the model? And basically it's um, undistinguishable for us whether um, um, buyers use only a single platform um, but are potentially active on many or are they only active on one platform and kind of single home and disregard the others? So I guess the question is a bit, is there a, a difference that is, is observable and not only comes out of the model? And I have two, if I have uh, one more minute, um, um, further remarks, which I think more are, are extensions. Um, I guess one of the major driving force, I guess, which is very nicely brought out in the, in the paper and also in the talk, is this idea of why a multi-homing as a seller, I can steer the buyers to trade with me through my favorite platform and my favorite platform means the platform why I have to pay them the lowest um, fee. And the way I'm doing this is I kind of, um, I'm not active on, on, on more expensive platforms, which kind of destroys the sellers, sorry, the buyer's possibility to interact with a seller seller on a platform which is expensive for a seller. And so one question is, well, the only possibility in the model that the seller has to steer buyers is kind of via completely disconnecting and um, with the more expensive platforms. And so a potentially interesting extension could be whether there are other ways um, um, to steer buyers to trade via the favorite platform. So maybe I'm offering some products only on this platform and only low quality products on the other platform. But I mean, this is of course way beyond the model. It was just a thought um, um, that crossed my mind. And so the last um, um, also as a very global question is that since this um, consumer loyalty index or buyer loyalty index um, is very prominent, I think it's a, it's a novel feature that I haven't seen before. A question would be um, um, how is it possible to empirically kind of um, get a grip 
on this object. Um, so could one kind of test this with potential elasticities, whereas these elasticities are a bit different to the standard ones, because although I'm, I'm, I'm active on all of the platforms, I'm only using some of them. And so is there a potential way to kind of um, um, get more empirical content on this, uh, I would say, very nice um, uh, new object? 